Okay, everyone, today we are going to talk about tetanus. Tetanus is a disease that is ubiquitous to everywhere in the world. So it's not something that just happens here. Remember, we talked about West Nile and Venezuelan equine encephalitis. So this is a disease that happens everywhere in the world because it's a bacteria that inhabits the soil. So this bacteria uh, that causes tetanus is called Clostridium tetani. And this particular bacteria is part of a group of bacteria, which is all the Clostridium type of bacteria that we have heard of, such as Clostridium difficile, Clostridium perfringens. Those types of bacteria, all the Clostridium family, they are going to be what we call anaerobic. What does that mean? That means that they uh, thrive in the absence of oxygen. So they live in the soil, they live, 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 but when they find a, a, a um, an environment that is uh, absent of oxygen, so an anaerobic type of environment, they start to produce spores and they start to release what we call exotoxins. Exotoxins are um, toxins that go and get spread, but they are released when the bacteria or whatever organism is creating the toxin is still alive. Okay, so exotoxins, they get uh, released uh, when the bacteria is alive and they continue to do it in the absence of oxygen. So I am going to share here the PowerPoint. Let's see where the heck here. Uh, and, do... and then after that, we are going to talk about uh, botulism. Okay, so it is one of the other things about this particular disease is that it's an infectious disease. Infectious meaning it is caused by an infectious agent. In this case, it's Clostridium tetani, but it's not contagious. If you guys remember, we talked about the difference between a disease being contagious and a disease being infectious. So it is infectious in nature. It's caused by a bacteria, but it cannot spread from animal to animal or even from animal to human, even though humans can also get the disease. So it is not contagious. Once the animal has it, you can touch him, you can do anything with him, you are not gonna get the disease and it, he cannot spread to another um, animal, like another horse, for example, such as influenza or herpes virus, et cetera. Uh, one of the things uh, that is important about this and the reason why it's not contagious is because that bacteria is going to start forming spores uh, in the absence of oxygen. And that's the case when we have, for example, puncture wounds that we insert the bacteria into this, into this puncture wound, which as we remember, it's deeper than it's wide. And then when there is a little scab in that wound, it creates that anaerobic um, environment. So the bacteria can uh, start to produce its spores. Important, and I want you guys to put a star beside this, it is, it is characterized by rigid paralysis. So there is paralysis and this paralysis is rigid, meaning it's hard, okay? It is a very, very, very old disease. It was characterized in Egypt over 3,000 years ago. Uh, and therefore it is um, very well, it's very well described, okay? The etiology, as we have said, is uh, the Clostridium tetani. The Clostridium tetani is a mobile, meaning it can move, okay? It's an anaerobic, it lives without oxygen, gram-positive bacteria. It is an inhabitant of soils everywhere and horses, so it, it can be isolated from horses' feces, meaning that the horse will eat it, eat, eat it with regular pasture and, and continue to eliminate it. So it's just part of the soil, part of the farm life, part of everything that horses um, are around. Uh, horse, the horse, humans are also very, very sensitive, but horse of the, of the animals is the most sensitive animal to the tetanus toxin. So a very little amount of the toxin is actually, is going to cause the disease in horses. What is the route of infection? So like I said, uh, puncture wounds contaminated with manure or, you know, soil, anything that the bacteria is present generally is the most common uh, way that the horse gets infected with because um, puncture wounds, like I said, it creates the optimum environment for this bacteria to continue to uh, release their toxins. And, uh, but 
even like for in humans, in humans it's not necessarily puncture wounds, sometimes like bike accidents or any accident, that, that's generally the most described, is accidents like uh, motorcycle accidents, bike accidents, when people scrape um, their arms. Let me just share me here. How do we do this? Okay, when people scrape their arms and then they create scabs and underneath the scab uh, is an anaerobic type of environment and that particular area can also create uh, an environment for this bacteria to, to produce the toxins. What is important, and that's one of the most important things, and we learned this when we we're talking about wound management, is how, um, how do we kill this bacteria? Because they are anaerobic, what is the first line of defense uh, to kill this bacteria is to blast them with oxygen. And how do we do that? We do that by, um, in, you know, adding hydrogen peroxide to the wound so you can actually kill those bacteria even before they even think about um, producing the toxins, okay? So contaminated surgical wounds can also be a problem, injection abscesses, navel, anything that can create scabs or areas of anaerobic environment. Uh, that being said, causative wounds are not found in about 15 to 30 percent of horses. So these horses die and nobody knows it's tetanus, but they cannot find the wounds that cause the disease in horses. So that's an, another thing that we think may happen is that uh, gastric ulcers or other types of ulcerations or areas in the GI tract that uh, create that environment and then the bacteria start to form the toxins and get uh, they start to get, uh, gain the circulation of the body and they go around in the body uh, creating the disease, which we're going to talk here in a second. But it, it, it's causing the disease. The disease occurs everywhere in the world. There are two toxins that are produced. One of them is called tetanolysin, okay? Tetanolysin and tetanospasmin. You guys have to memorize this. So put a star on this particular slide. You have to memorize the names of these two toxins, okay? So the tetanolysin, lysis mean um, you break down the tissue. So the tetanolysin is going to damage the tissue, creating this favorable condition for the anaerobic infection. And the tetanospasmin, it creates spasms, okay? It is going to reach the bloodstream, reaching the peripheral nerve terminals throughout the body. Hold on just one second. Okay, let me go back to sharing the screen. Okay, so the tetanospasm is going to reach the bloodstream and is going to, this is important because it is going to reach the peripheral nerve terminals. Remember, we talked about the peripheral nerves, okay? And uh, they exist all over the body to create, you know, the, the system of signaling that comes from the brain and spinal cord to the nerves. And here's important. It is going to bind irreversibly, irreversibly, okay? Meaning it, there, there is no amount of you trying to unbind this uh, toxins. It's not going to happen. Uh, it is going to bind irreversibly to inhibitory neurons. The reason why I say this, if you guys remember when we were talking about antibiotics, that sofa drugs, they reversibly bind to the PABA receptors in the bacteria, meaning that you, if you don't maintain that level of uh, sofa drugs, because they, it's reversible, it's level dependent, uh, it can actually get unbound. In the case of this particular toxin, it binds irreversibly to inhibitory neurons and the result is going to be sustained excitatory discharge of the motor neurons which is going to lead to muscle rigidity and muscle spasms so let me go back and explain this so inhibitory neurons everyone here is going to remember a time in their lives when they were 12 13 14 and they were very accident prone what do i mean by that what i mean by that is that you would see a glass of water on the counter and you thought you, would going to, you were going to reach for the glass and then you hit the glass and the glass fell. And for a period of about three days to about a week, that happened 
uh, often, okay? So you were going to reach for the glass, boom, you hit the glass, the glass falls, water, mothers screaming, etc. What happens is this, our body, there is this sense called proprioception, meaning that we know where our body is at all times, unless we have some sort of neurologic deficit. But we know where our body is at all times, and we know exactly the, the amount of effort and the length that we have to be to grab the cup, to grab our cell phone, to grab anything. We know the length, the, the, the brain signals, arm, go and grab whatever it is, that object, okay? As we are arriving to grab this, there is inhibitory neurons that says your, you can you either need to reach this much or you can just reach a little bit. It's the inhibitory neurons that decide the distance and the amount of force that you have to, uh, to exercise, to grab, whatever it is. Uh, everybody here has uh, picked up a box that you think weighs very much and then it doesn't and then you pick it up like this because the inhibitory neuron said, you know what, you're going to need a lot of strength and a lot of force to pick up this box and I'm not going to inhibit anything. You need to use your full force. And when, when you do this and the box happens to be light, you're going to use more force than you need. Uh, what happens is this. So it's the inhibitory neurons that do this. In the case of tetanus, because these toxins are going to bind irreversibly to these neurons, uh, everything that the horse does, every contraction of the muscles is going to be full throttle, it's going to be full force. So instead of just like, you know, at the walk, you can leisurely walk, or if you have to stomp on something, you're going to stomp with more force. In the case of horses, every time that they have contraction, it's going to be full force, and uh, it, they have what we call tonic-clonic contraction. So uh, they're, all their muscles are going to be contracting at the same time. And not only, are we, remember when, we, when you guys studied anatomy, we have uh, the flexor muscles and the extensor muscles. And when one contracts, the other one by default is relaxed. So you can actually, you know, change the angle of the joint. In the case of tetanus, both flexors and extensor muscles, because they're all discharging at full force, are going to be contracting at the same time. And the problem is those muscles are going to start to getting degraded they're going to start, there, there, is, there, there can be um, muscle avulsion from the, from the bone because the strength is so strong that it can avulse and it can actually break bones because of the strength of the contractions. So it is not uh, necessarily a wonderful way to go, okay? The recovery of this disease requires the growth of new nerve terminals, which can take up to two, three weeks depending on the severity of the disease. So the truth is this, um, all muscles are contracting at the same time. That means that includes the diaphragm and horses generally are gonna die because of respiratory failure because the diaphragm, instead of relaxing to allow for the horse, because the diaphragm contracts to drain more air in and relaxes to let air out. So this respiratory, uh, back and forth of the diaphragm is going to be compromised and therefore the horse is going to die of respiratory failure. Uh, recovery requires new growth of terminals, meaning that uh, this horse is going to be need, we're going to need to keep this horse alive for weeks, uh, you know, giving him uh, just nursing care uh, but the problem is that sometimes horses need to be put in respirators, which we're hearing a lot about uh, these days. And you, we don't have respirators strong enough to maintain a horse alive for two, three, four weeks uh, of age, like a full-size adult horse. Uh, well, we are. So, what are the clinical signs uh, for this disease? We're going to have the rigidity of the neck and head muscles, which is going to give. Uh, the clinical sign of the name of the disease, which uh, in old times it used to be called lockjaw, because the horses literally, uh, hold on, come back, are going to have what they call the lockjaw, because his muscles are so tight that the horse cannot move his jaw. One of the clinical signs of this disease, which is petnomonic for this disease, is what they call risa sardonicus, meaning sarcastic smile for this horse, which is the horse is like this, and you're like, oh, you don't seem happy, but you seem to be smiling. Uh, but that's the rhesus sardonicus is 
one of the pet mnemonic signs for tetanus because they are unable to open their uh, mouths and you know obviously that is going to prevent them from drinking from eating etc another sign of the disease is the prolapse of the third eyelid so this as you guys know the third eyelid of horses come to cover their eyes when they see you know like in cases of race when there is mud being thrown into their face the third eyelid protects their eyes and they come and go uh, to clean the eyeballs and in the case of tetanus the third eyelid is just going to be there the entire time the muscles of the limbs trunks and tail because they're going to be all contracting we're going to have the sawhorse stance uh, and the tail is going to be in a position called the flag in flag position so the tail is just going to be also erect and the tail uh, standing out uh, horses at one point are going to have to lay down so they have recumbency and they are not able to get back up and we like i said we're going to have tonic spasm uh, initiated by external stimuli meaning this horse is laying down and maybe trying to calm himself down and then when there's a stimulus which can be sound light or touch they're going to start having these contractions all over again um, so that becomes a problem too for the treatment of these horses so as you guys can see here just by this alone you can uh or just all the clinical signs you can understand how we are going to treat this horse so because they are in, unable to eat or drink what do we have to do we have to keep them on fluids for hydration um, because they um are laying down or because we have uh contractions of the muscles one part of the treatment is obviously to put them on muscle relaxants because here's the thing because this is not a central nervous system disease and these horses are fully aware of what's happening but they just cannot move so you can imagine that this is a scary situation for a horse you know because they are prey animals and they are always alert to know that things are happening around them and they are simply unable to move so another line of treatment is to heavily sedate these horses so they are unaware of their surroundings until and to keep this horse alive until uh you you know the new nerve terminals are created the other problem is that a horse that is in recumbency you either have to turn him every two hours or you need to keep him on a sling on IV fluids, on a padded stall, so they are not thrashing and hurting themselves. You need to protect their eyes, so you need to put, you know, helmets and uh, and eye masks on them. So it's just a very, very, very expensive disease to treat when the prevention is close to a hundred percent useful in the uh, with vaccines. So tetanus vaccines protect these horses close to 100%. The, the truth is we wanna say 100%, but obviously we don't know of all the cases that happen, but every horse that acquires tetanus has an unknown vaccination history or a poor vaccination history, meaning it's vaccinated once every you know, five years, it changes owners, we don't know what is going on, etc. okay? Um, so here, just continue on, on the clinical signs uh, because the inhibitory neurons are going to be affected. And I already talked about this. So, you know, there is uh, rhabdomyolysis is just the word for muscle getting degraded uh, the entire time, which in the case of rhabdomyolysis, if the horse continues to be alive, it can actually cause severe damage to kidneys. And that's another reason for uh, hydration of these horses. We already talked about this, tendon of ocean, fracture of bones, death due to respiratory failure already talked about this uh the diagnosis is based on clinical signs and history of poor vaccine it's very 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 um the clinical signs are just tetanus everybody actually knows now i grew up in brazil as you all know and we see cases of tetanus in brazil semi you know regularly because vaccination there is not you know people are poor we have a lot of horses that are work horses and here tetanus is just included in every single combo vaccine uh, so anytime that you vaccinate your horse pretty much for anything tetanus is included because it is known 
that tetanus is such a, a problem disease in horses. Now I have a friend that one day called me and she said, oh my, you need to help me. Uh, my miniature horse, uh, we found him in the pasture and he seemed really, really stiff. And I was like, okay, tell me more. And he was walking with a very stiff gait and he just couldn't move. His neck was really stiff. And, you know, when we came, we brought him to the barn and he was sweating and I hosed him off. Um, and then he just like died later on that day. And I said, so, okay. So when was the last time he had his tetanus vaccine? And she said, oh no, we don't vaccinate our, our miniature horses. I said, I'm sorry, what? She said, no, we don't because we thought that miniature horses because of their size didn't need to receive vaccines. So I said, okay, her name is Stephanie. Okay, Stephanie, you effectively killed your horse for, you know, by something that is easily uh, avoidable, which is tetanus. And it's a crappy way to die. So, and this is another thing that people ask is draft horses as opposed to regular size horses, you know, the light breeds and miniature horses, do they have to have one, two times a dose of vaccine and the miniature horses, uh, half a dose of a vaccine? No, vaccine is the same size for draft, for adult size horses, for miniature horse, for foals is the same amount of uh, antigen because research shows that for, to be able to stimulate the immune system, you have to receive a certain number of antigens, okay? And that's why also in humans, kids receive the same dose as adults for vaccine as well. We have talked about the treatment, so safe and quiet environment. Remember that sound can also be a way, uh, a stimulus that can uh, send this horse to tonic-clonic contractions of the muscles. Uh, one other way also that we can do is to eliminate the unbound toxin in the body. So we, when a horse actually has tetanus, you administer the antitoxin and that is going to bind to these unbound toxins that are still circulating, finding, trying to find neurons to join to. So this is one of the ways to also do this. It's necessary to do it. It's not very expensive. It's cheap. Uh, the tetanus vaccine in itself is probably $3. Okay. The antitoxin is not very expensive either. Okay. What is expensive to treat these horses is the amount that they need to spend in the hospital trying to recuperate. And about, I already talked about sedation and muscle relaxation. Uh, general support. And here's the thing, mortality is about 75% of the cases if detected early, okay? When the horse is already, uh, the disease has already established itself, it's going to be lower chances of survival. So this is just, as you can see, the prolapse of the third eyelid on these horses, okay? Uh, the horse is in a saw horse stance with a flag in tail, as you can see here. Okay, so horse stance, uh, everything is rigid. As you can see, the ears are like pricked up, the neck is rigid, everything is very rigid about these horses. So let me share some videos of this particular disease. Let's see. Okay. So here, okay, horse is having the tonic clonic um, contractions. That was a short video. Stop here. Let me just turn this on. Uh, this is a foal, as you can see, in a sawhorse stance, okay, shaking. Okay, he just, he simply can move very rigid neck rigid jaw and he simply can't move uh, this and if you guys remember we have to vaccinate mares prior to foaling so when they are young like this they already drank the colostrum that has the antibodies okay so this is not this foal um, doesn't have a high chance of survival let me see the other screen to share, come on. Okay, and then the other screen, 
this is another video of that. So as you can see, the horse is sweating, okay? Play, my friend. Horse is sweating. They get a very agitated kind of look in their eyes just because they are aware of what's going on. I don't understand why this horse still has a rug on when he is sweating, he's not uh, doing well. And obviously this owner doesn't have a clue uh, of what's going on. Uh, let's see this other video here, muscle twitching due to tetanus. Okay, as you can see, okay, and this horse, look at him, in a stake, tetanus, the flag, tail. And then we're going to see here a horse that is, this is in Spain, uh, a horse that uh, is going to be walking. So you can see how this horse is walking. You can see the third eyelid. When this horse um, blinks, you can see that he's showing the third eyelid. Uh, let's see. They're trying to make this horse walk to come to the hospital to get treated. You can see the third eyelid. Okay, look at his tail that he doesn't have. So when a horse is arriving at this state in a hospital, hopefully you can administer the antitoxin and you can hopefully keep this horse alive. If you are unable to keep the horse alive, the humane thing to do is to kill, to euthanize the horse, okay? Like once, I, and this is all um, sweat, from the horse. Uh, like I said before, also, you see the third eyelid there, is that it's a very cheap disease to prevent, not cheap at all to, okay, here, uh, not very cheap to treat this horse, okay? So very easy to prevent, not very easy to treat, okay? Let's see what, what else we have here. Uh, prevention, the vaccination, it has an initial dose of two to three doses, initial series of two to three doses, and then you give an annual booster. Brood mares are gonna be boosted four to six weeks prepartum, and then injured horses, depending on if this horse was uh, vaccinated within the last six months, uh, the veterinarian may just reboost his vaccine, and sometimes if it has been more than maybe a year since this horse was vaccinated, the veterinarian may also choose to uh, administer the antitoxin as part of the treatment and prevention of the disease. It's just going to depend on the type of wound this horse has received, his clinical signs, and what exactly is going on with this horse, okay, at the time that the veterinarian sees him. So if you guys have any questions, so this is tetanus. What do I need to know? Everything about it, okay? Causative agent, the clinical signs, the reason why they happen, which is the, the, the pathology of the disease, uh, how to treat and how to prevent based on the clinical signs you guys uh, are gonna do great. So just email me if you have any questions and I will also meet with you tomorrow at 10 a.m. in Zoom.